Funding for this program is provided by the partners of Read North Dakota, our authors, our stories, and by the members of Prairie Public. Winemere, North Dakota native Chuck Klosterman is the New York Times bestselling author of seven books, including his newest novel, The Visible Man. After graduating from the University of North Dakota, Chuck served as a reporter at the Fargo Forum before moving to New York City. He has written for publications as diverse as GQ, Spin, The Washington Post, and ESPN, and now writes about sports and pop culture for Grantland.com. Read North Dakota is proud to present North Dakota-born author Chuck Klosterman. Well, hey, thank you very much. Uh, so nice to see all these people out here. I, I really appreciate you coming out. I was very flattered to be asked to do this. Um, it's great to be back in Bismarck. I haven't been here for a while. Uh, I was very pleased to see the mall is still carpeted, <laughs> which I feel sort of to kind of defines a capital city, right? You know, like you, know, you can go to Fargo or Minot or Grand Forks, they have malls, you know, but are they vacuumed? <laughs> they are not. Um, well, you know, uh, it, I, I did uh, just publish my second novel, which, uh, the, the Visible Man. I guess ostensibly that's what I was uh, brought here to talk about. Although, you know, I haven't done a lot of book readings in North Dakota, and in a way, I really think to myself, you know, uh, my goal has always been not to just write a book. You know, I mean, of course, in a way, that's your, the simplest way to describe it. But I sort of think of all my books as one big book in a way. Uh, that that m sort of my maturation as a writer, but also just as a person, is sort of traced through these seven books, uh, five of which are nonfiction and two of which uh, are novels. And uh, I've decided what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about all seven of these books. Uh, at the end, if hopefully if I have enough time, I'll read a little bit from The Visible Man. I'm not really a big fan of reading in public. Uh, I think book readings is kind of a failed concept. You know, uh, reading is supposed to be a solitary experience, you know? I mean, I guess unless, you know, you're a child <laughs> and the book is go dot go, then it makes sense to have someone read it directly. Uh, but the fact that, like, this is being televised, I can't imagine someone flipping around on television and be like, oh, hey, wait, that dude is reading behind a podium. <laughs> you know, I am not checking out the Jersey Shore now. Like, this is, um, uh, so, uh, you know, I guess my, as my career as a writer really began, I suppose, first at the University of North Dakota, and then I worked at the Forum newspaper for four years, from 1994 to 1998. Uh, and then I moved to Akron, Ohio. I got a job at the Akron Beacon Journal. Uh, and that was really when my career as a kind of a, an author began, uh, because I went to a city where I had no friends at all. Uh, so what do you do if you have no friends? Well, maybe you write a book. You know? <laughs> Uh, I also had been making about like $22,000 a year in Fargo, and when I went to the Akron Beacon Journal, they had a union, so I was making like $44,000. So I felt rich, rich enough to buy a computer, the other essential element, along with having no friends, to writing a book. <laughs> and you know, I, knew, I always knew I wanted to write a book, I guess. I guess even when I was a little kid and I was just drawing pictures of dinosaurs in my mind, these were like narrative stories, uh, the, you know, it would be like four tigers fighting a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Uh, that's what I'd be drawing. And I would sort of think to myself how this would be described in a science fiction story. Uh, so I knew I wanted to do this, but, you know, how do you write a book? That's a, it's a, a question that I guess anybody who's written a book at one point in their life deals with. And uh, I, I didn't even know if I could do it necessarily. I mean, I didn't know if I could physically do it. I didn't know if I could type 80,000 words about one idea. So the first thing I needed, of course, was the idea. Now, as I said, I'm in Akron, Ohio. I have no friends. Uh, what am I doing in my free time? Well, I'm usually going to like Barnes and Nobles and Borders bookstore and just kind of wandering around. I think I had this idea that if I wandered around bookstores, somehow, a woman would fall in love with me. <laughs> I realize this sounds like a bad plan, and I will admit it was short-sighted. 
But that was sort of my idea, that you'd be walking around the store, and I would see an attractive woman, and she'd be looking at books, and then I would say, boy, isn't it crazy there's so many books about whatever she was looking at? And somehow that would start a conversation, because there's too many books about every subject. Like, you know, it's surprising how many books there are about draft horses, you know, and she would laugh, and it would take off from there. Well, this, of course, did not work. <laughs> um, however, I did end up coming up with an idea for what became my first book. Uh, because I write about rock music, or I always have, professionally at least, and I'm just interested in music in general, I would often find myself hanging around the music section of the store. And uh, I would look at the various books, and there was books about virtually every genre of music that existed. There would be books on jazz, and books on, lots of books on punk and disco. There would be books on alt country. Uh, there would be books on virtually every kind of music, except the music I had listened to growing up, which, which was exclusively hair metal. Uh, when I was living in Wyoming, North Dakota, all I listened to was like Motley Crue and Kiss and Rat and Bang Tango and Fester Pussycat and Poison. This was sort of the totality of my cultural existence. Um, but that's just sort of how it is. I mean, I'm sure there's people in this room who can understand this. When you're in a really small town, you might have a craving for art. You don't even know that at the time. Like, I would have never said when I was 15, I crave art, but I guess I did. And the only way I could sort of access it was through, like, a Guns N' Roses record. So I would think about a Guns N' Roses record the way, like, a smart person would think about Kafka. I would just invest all <laughs> this energy into, like, what this record meant and sort of what the liner notes were and the lyrics were really important to me and the iconography and the visuals, all of these things. So, you know, I'm leaving in one of these bookstores one day, driving home, and uh, I was like, well, you know, somebody should really write a book about, you know, 80s metal. But then I was like, well, I guess everyone who listened to Motley Crue is illiterate. <laughs> Probably no market. But then I thought to myself, well, you know, I'm not totally illiterate. And in fact, a lot of the smartest people I had met at college had all had this same experience where, uh, you know, when we were young, we listened to this specific kind of tier of music, and uh, then we got into college and our tastes changed, maybe we got into Nirvana or the Pixies or whatever, but at the time, that was really important, and these were very smart guys, you know, and, and people who uh, were a lot like me, so I started thinking that there was maybe an audience for this, but the year is 1998, and it's hard sort of to illustrate how unpopular those bands were in 1998. <laughs> It's different now because over time, of course, every era gets rediscovered. And there's sort of this nostalgia for the 1980s now. And, you know, there's like the, a band called The Darkness, which was sort of a, like a British parody of heavy metal. And, and, you know, Motley Crue did an oral history and it was very successful. But it wasn't like this in 1998. In 1998, people were actively lying that they had listened to this music, <laughs> you know? You would meet someone, you know, I would remember, I would remember them that they had listened to like Metallica and they would be like, oh, I liked The Cure in high school. And I was like, did you really? Is this, you know? Um, so I was thinking to myself, how, could I, how can I write a book about something that's so unpopular, people will pretend they didn't have an experience with it? <laughs> and my conclusion was, write an academic book. Because that can be anything. I mean, if you look at academic titles, it'll be things like, you know, sexual mores of the middle class during the Bronze Age. <laughs> Obviously not a huge audience for that book, but because the idea is meaningful, somebody says this is a valid thing to exist. So I thought, here's what I will do. I will write an academic book about what it's like to grow up in a rural place uh, and have heavy metal sort of be the soundtrack for your existence and your understanding of culture. I thought to myself, I'm not an academic. I, don't have a master's degree, but I'll sort, I've always been sort of interested in using academic language. I'm going to write about this music in this way. So that's what I did. I just sat down and basically wrote about 150 pages uh, of my sort of criticism and analysis of, you know, uh, like bands like Rat. And when I had this 150 pages, I read through it, and I thought to myself, well, I've read books worse than this. I wasn't totally sure it was good. I didn't think it was good, in fact. I kind of thought it might be bad, but I, know things, I knew that there were things that were worse. So then I thought, what I'll do is, I will just send this to academic 
presses around the country. Just send it to them. So I would send it to like Duke University Press and Harvard University Press, you know. Uh, I don't know what I put in the cover letter, what my explanation for doing this was. Uh, but I got a letter back from a woman at Columbia University. And you know, I've lost this letter and it really bothers me because I would love to find this woman again. She changed my life. I owe her thousands of dollars, you know. Uh, she sent me this letter back and uh, she said, well, you know, I like this book. I can't publish it. We can't publish it uh, for two reasons. Uh, one is that we're an academic press and you swear way too much. <laughs> but the other thing she said was that the most interesting parts of this book are when you use your own life experience to sort of explain this music, which I must admit I was doing purely out of necessity. There's just no academic precedent for listening to the band Tesla. Like, you cannot find it anywhere, okay? So I would have to go like, oh, my friend Duke liked Tesla, you know? Made him crazy. This is why, I think, you know? But she goes, these parts are really unique, you know? I've never heard this sort of idea described, or I've never seen someone write or read someone write about these bands in this way. And she was like, you should expand that part of the book, and this should become a trade book. Well, I'll tell you what, this shows how naive I was about publishing. I didn't know what a trade book was. I knew there were trade magazines, which would be like Carpenter's Monthly or whatever. So I was like, there's a whole section of trade books about spe topics so specific they include listening to heavy metal in North Dakota. <laughs> like, if these books exist and I'm not buying them, who is? But then I realized something. <laughs> trade books are not like trade magazines. Trade magazines are about a specific idea. Trade books are like books. <laughs> They're in stores. So. Uh, <laughs> So I pretty much took this woman's advice. Uh, I had this 150 pages of criticism, maybe 100 pages of criticism, I'm not even sure. And then I wrote another 150 or 200 pages that was just about my memories of growing up in Wymere, driving around in pickups, drinking beer in these pickups and listening to this music and talking about this music and especially sitting in my bedroom and listening to by myself and like looking at a Motley Crue poster and just wondering about it. And then I took the, all this text and I chopped it up into smaller sections, put it in chronological order, and then had this book. Um, now what do you do with a book? You've written it. I know no one in New York. I know no one in the publishing industry. How does one publish a book if you know no one? Well, uh, my first plan was sort of tricky. I didn't do this, but it almost worked. It's kind of my advice to writers. Um, say you've written a book and you want to get it published. You have no contacts. Here's what you do. Go to the bookstore and find a book that's similar to yours. Not the same, not the same topic, but just sort of similar in tone. Maybe similar philosophically. Go to the acknowledgments page. The first person every author thanks is their editor. Find the editor's name. Figure out the, you know, call the publishing house they work for and make sure you call them at lunch or at night so they are not there. Okay? <laughs> And you basically say like, hey, Mr. You know, so-and-so, uh, I saw that you're the editor of this book, you know, and I'm really intrigued by it, and I'd like to ask you a few questions about it. That person will think you want to write a story about their book, so they will call you back, which is all you're hoping for, because if they call you, they can't hang up. <laughs> if you call them and they pick up the phone and you start saying what you want to do, they'll be like, it doesn't work that way, click. But if they call you, they're obligated by kind of the rules of society to let you talk for about 90 seconds. <laughs> and then you have 90 seconds to pitch your book, which is what I did. And the publisher was Billboard Books. And to my surprise, the guy was like, that sounds interesting. Send it to me. So I send him what I have. And uh, then an interesting thing happened. They wanted to publish it, but they wanted to publish it very differently than what I had kind of given them. Uh, they wanted it to be more of an encyclopedia of heavy metal. They wanted to have all these photographs. Uh, they just wanted a very kind of glossy, different book. Um, and they, didn't wanna, they wanted to pay $9,000, uh, which isn't that much, obviously, in the world of publishing. But at the time, I had like $1,000. So it seemed like a lot, OK? Uh, but I turned them down. And uh, this was shocking to many of my friends, most of whom could not believe, A, I wrote a book, but then B, did not let someone publish it. But I'm so glad I did this because, you know, if I have any, I don't really have a lot of advice. I don't really know that much about how the world works. But I will say this to anybody out here who wants to write a book, 
or you know, make a record, make a film, do anything that's creative. You really have to feel as though the thing you're making makes you happy because in 50 years, no one's going to care but you. And that seems depressing, but it's true. There are authors from the New York Times bestsellers list from 50 years ago, books that were sort of the fabric of cultural conversation at the time, and nobody in this room knows who they are. The only person who does is that person. They still have their book on their shelf. They're very old now, but they're looking up at it. <laughs> and if they feel good about that book, they're a success. I mean, in 50 years, no one's going to know who I am. Okay, it's, I'm just going to be, unless something completely out of the ordinary happens, something that is you know, too fantastical to imagine, I, like pretty much every other kind of creative person in the world, will disappear through the sands of time. But I will still have a relationship with the work. And I would not have been happy if that book became what I put all this effort into. So I said no. I was like, well, I'll just kind of wait it out, right? You know? By chance, I have a friend who got into the NYU Creative Writing Program. He is working at a, if you get into the NYU Creative Writing Program, a lot of the students there get clerical jobs during the summer at like a publishing house or a literary agency. He gets one of these jobs. He tells me, I can't get you a literary agent. If I could get you a literary agent, I'd get myself one. But here's the one thing I can do. If you send me the manuscript, I can put it on someone's desk. Because half of the books they get, they read the cover letter, see that it's not commercial, and throw it away. So I can save you one step. So I give my friend this manuscript. He puts it on someone's desk. Shockingly, a guy calls me the next day. It's a guy named Todd Keithley. He says, hey, I want to be your agent. I haven't been an agent long. I've been an agent nine months. He was younger than me. <laughs> he said, I've only sold one book. It's like a social history of pirates. But I want to sell your book. I didn't, you know, and he was sort of a, you know, he's a kind of an agent who was learning how to be an agent, so he kind of talked like Jerry Maguire. He was saying things like, you're the man, you know, and it's like <laughs> talking about my second book, and I'm like, I'm not even sure the first one exists, you know. So, um, but I finally agreed to let him do it, and he sold the book uh, in a week. It just, I, 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 I know you're supposed to have these stories about all these hardships you go through. I was incredibly lucky. I've been an incredibly fortunate person my whole life. I've had no hardship. This was a great example of it. I did this, just worked out. That book was Fargo Rock City. My initial title was Appetite for Deconstruction, which I still think is a much better title. But that was the one big compromise I had to make. I had to sort of change the title. And you can, I can live with that, because I knew what was inside the book was the same. Well, that book comes out. It didn't sell like crazy. I think it sold 12,000 copies in hardcover, but it seemed like the right sort of person read it. A lot of people who were involved in the media industry, um, a lot of people uh, who worked in you know, newspapers and magazines. So I got a degree of, of attention from this book and then immediately felt this great pressure that I realized I can do this. Like I can write books and they will exist and they will be in stores. I got to keep doing this, you know? Um, because the, in the first book, Unconsciously, I'd probably been thinking about for 10 years, you know, even before I had an idea of doing a book like that, I had been thinking about this music and this part of my life. Um, you know, a big part of that book is just sort of how kind of obsession defines personality when you're in high school. The thing that you're obsessed with, it doesn't matter if it's metal music. Like, I, I, I really am always happy when people read Fugger Rock City and they say they like the book, even though they don't like any, any of the bands because I think they're really sort of getting what the idea of that book was, which is that, you know, when you're young, you understand yourself through other things. I was trying to understand myself, you know, uh, through the music of Wasp and like Ozzy Osbourne, you know. Uh, it was a confusing time in anyone's life. So I, I just wanted to write this book that I had always wanted to read but could never find. I guess that's another good piece of advice. If you're interested in writing a book and you don't know how or what to write about, try to write the book that you've always wanted to read that for whatever reason does not exist in the world. Um, but as I said, I was very nervous after this came out because I knew I wanted to do another book and, there was, and I just was like, well, I hadn't really thought of this. You know, I'd, I'd put all this time into doing this one thing and now I've got to come up with this brand new idea. 
So my first idea was I was going to do a book about how the Lakers and Celtics basketball rivalry during the 1980s defines everything you need to know about the world. <laughs> um, which is still kind of true. But I didn't know if I could write 75,000 words about it. That's what, what the, you know, it, it would be a big commitment. Um, or more accurately, I thought I could probably write 75,000 words about this, but 60,000 of them would be bad. <laughs> so I decided I would just write an essay about this. I could do 5,000 words about this idea, and it'll be really tight, and it will really get the idea across, and that will be sort of, it will have all the ideas a book would have in this small space. So I did that, with no real idea of how it was going to fit into anything else. My next idea then for a book was to write about uh, the, uh, MTV's The Real World and how I felt the real world was shaping people's personality as opposed to the way the original idea of that show was to sort of show real, real young people in the world, sort of see what they're really like, uh, when in fact I think the opposite process happened, that once it became this mediated TV event, people started adopting those characteristics themselves. Here again, though, I didn't know if that was a book. I didn't know if it was 80,000 words of interesting. But there again, I thought, maybe I could just do an essay on it. So I wrote about a four, four or 5,000 word essay on that. So now I have these two essays. And uh, as I read through them, I realize that fundamentally, my interest in both idioms is the same. I'm really interested in the audience. And I'm interested in how something that exists to the world at large is sort of incorporated in people's lives and sort of allows them to sort of think about themselves while they're technically thinking about something else. So then I thought to myself, well, maybe this is really the important idea. Maybe the important idea here is that people want to think critically about the art that informs their life, even if they don't put it in those words. Like, you know, uh, in the intellectual community, for example, there's the New Yorker and, you know, uh, you know, the Atlantic and Harper's and all, all these places where people can really think seriously about, uh, you know, various books and music and film. But very often, the books and TV shows and, and bands and films they're talking about, the average person doesn't really have a relationship with. So they're cut out of that conversation immediately. They're not really able to have a critical idea kind of work through their mind through someone else because they don't really have a context for what the subject is. So I was like, I'm going to write about low culture things. I'm going to write about things like Saved by the Bell, <laughs> this Saturday morning live action TV show that no one in the world would classify as art. And yet, kind of uses all the tropes of art, has conflict, has character, as characters change, as people feel certain things, tries to make the audience feel a certain way. You know, I wrote about breakfast cereal. Um, I wrote about how movies uh, were sort of shaping uh, people's perception of romantic success uh, and how that was sort of dooming people to unhappiness, uh, which really isn't a new idea. I suppose it's something people have been kind of dealing with forever, but I was like, I'm gonna use things in the present tense. Um, and then I wrote all these essays. So now I have this collection of essays. Um, and it ended up being this book called Sex, Drugs, and Cocoa Puffs. Um, uh, the title, again, I had to change. My initial title, I'm not going to explain why, but the title I wanted was American Minotaur. <laughs> and I had a very elaborate description as to why. It had to do with, like, you know, it was a time when, like, American beauty and American psycho and all that stuff was really hot. I thought it was kind of funny how you could just take the word American and put it in front of anything else. I also kind of thought Minotaur was some metaphor for society, and we were going through this maze of life, and the Minotaur was there. <laughs> On the advice of my editor and my new agent, <laughs> Todd Keithley is no longer my agent. His wife got into med school, so we had to quit. Um, <laughs> I have this new agent now, and they're like, don't call it that. Um, so I ended up calling it Sex, Drugs, and Cocoa Puffs. And I'll admit, I, I still kind of think that's a stupid sounding title. Like, I, I hate seeing it. I hate saying it aloud. Um, and yet, that book has been more successful than everything else I've ever done in my life. Uh, that book now has sold, I think, 550,000 copies. It still sells about 50,000 copies a year. It's paid for a lot of drinks and a lot of televisions. Um, and it's kind of weird because, you know, uh, I think from a, from a writing standpoint, it's maybe my worst book. I wrote it so fast. I wrote that whole book in three months, I think. 
uh, just because I was just jacked up to do it. Uh, and now when I read it, it looks sloppy. There's a lot of parts in that book that are really contradictory, sometimes within the same paragraph. <laughs> I will seem to make two diametrically opposed arguments. But, um, and yet, what can I say, man? It's the book everyone likes the most. It's by far the most successful one. If someone stood up right now and shot me and I died, and there was an obit in the Bismarck Tribune tomorrow, that would be in the opening paragraph. It would also become the highest rated show in the history of Prairie Public Television. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, so, so I'm really happy about it. I mean, I'm obviously happy how this worked. I mean, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to criticize this book being like, oh, it's the popular one, so that means it's bad. I'm not like that. It's just weird. The success was very odd for me. Um, but great, you know, I'm here again. No hardships, just things just work out. This book that I just sort of did because I needed, an, I couldn't think of one good idea, so I thought of 18 okay ones and it ended up being this book that is now like why I get to be here. Um, by this point now, I, I'm out of Akron, I'm living in New York, I'm working for Spin Magazine, I'm working for Esquire, and uh, I'm starting to think about a third book, and uh, I do a story for Spin where I drive across the entire country. Uh, going to places where uh, rock stars had died. You know, like not their gravesite, but like where the Leonard Skinner plane hit the ground. And the, the location of the greenhouse where Kurt Cobain shot himself. And the actual apartment where the guitar player for the replacements drank himself to death. And, and where the Allman Brothers motorcycle accident happened. Like just kind of retracing this trip. So driving across the country, not with the intention of writing a book, but just doing this story, which is supposed to be kind of this epic road story for the magazine. And I write that, and the story's probably six or 7,000 words. But the whole day, you know, this is a three-week trip, so I'm writing every day kind of in a diary form. So I realize at the end, I essentially have what's very close to a book. And the stuff that's not in the magazine is the stuff that's much more interesting to me. Um, it was sort of... A lot about the way I viewed uh, the idea of mortality, I mean, in a very specific way, uh, in this idea that somehow when you die, uh, the, way your change, the way your reputation changes is obviously positive, but also very different. And, and I was wondering why that was. And I was also, I was in, you know, I was in kind of in love with a woman in New York. And I was still thinking about this woman I used to have been involved with. And then I couldn't figure out who I wanted to be with. So I decided to ask this third woman I used to go out with. <laughs> and I, I was really writing about these things that I loved. I mean, I loved music. I loved these women. Um, I, I, I sort of loved the idea of sort of thinking about my life outside of itself. Um, and I ended up with this book uh, that was called Killing Yourself to Live, uh, which is a title from a Black Sabbath song. And uh, this book was supposed to be the really successful one. Because the way the publishing industry works, it was like, okay, the first book sold this much, and then the second book sold this much, so this third one's going to sell this much. Like they, they just sort of imagine that whatever your audience size increases, that'll just happen until infinity. And that's not how it works. Um, so when this book came out, like it did, it did good, it did all right, but it didn't do like the second one, and a lot of people really hated it. Because a lot of people saw it as extremely self-indulgent and very narcissistic and solipsistic. And it absolutely was. Um, I, I don't see that as a problematic thing. Like, I'm writing the book. The book is about me. It's like, I don't, I, it, it, I'm, not, I'm not forcing people to read it. The state is not demanding people to read this book, if you, you know. I mean, and of all my books, you know, it, it's my favorite, okay? I, it's the one that I think I will always love the most. And if somebody asks, like, which of your books, you know, should I read? I always think, well, you might hate it, but this is the one that I like the most. Um, I just, there were some very unique things about that book. Uh, the most unique to me, and this is, again, something that I could have never planned, but it's just, it's kind of a, like a turning point in my life or whatever. Uh, I was driving through Minneapolis. I was visiting the place where the guitar player for the replacements had died. And I visited a friend of mine from, uh, I went to college with, a guy who grew up in Napoleon, North Dakota. And uh, he introduces me to this woman who he's kind of friends with. We're partying that night. Good night. Say goodbye to her. I take off the next day and drive away. But I'm doing it a diary style, right? So I'm typing about everything that happens along the way. Um, 
And much to my surprise, I ended up marrying this woman. <laughs> Years later, okay? But I'll tell you what, how cool is it that I have a present tense description of the night I met my wife? <laughs> I mean, that's an amazing thing. I, I, you know, everybody here who's married, you can probably remember the night that you met your spouse, you know? But you, did you write everything down? You know, probably not. <laughs> you probably weren't aware you were going to marry them. I certainly wasn't, you know? Um, but like I said, I'll never write a book like this again, though, uh, because writing about all these experiences in my life involved me writing about all these different people. And I guess I overlooked the complexity of writing about other people's lives simply because they intersected with mine. Uh, this must seem obvious to everyone, but it didn't to me. I mean, I always thought to myself, well, you know, this would be, it must be interesting, right? You know, I'd be interested to hear what she thought of me or whatever, you know? Not everyone's like that, you know? Uh, the worst part was, uh, not the, I mean, this is the, it's odd. The worst part, and in some ways a satisfying part, was uh, one of the women didn't read the book until much later, the night before I was appearing to do a book reading in her town. Uh, she just didn't want to read it, then finally thought, well, I'm going to go to this book reading. What if he says something weird about me that's totally untrue? I bet, it, you know. So she reads the book like the night before she goes to this reading. And we remained friends, so we went out and had drinks afterwards. So I asked her, like, how did you feel about this book? And she said, well, you know, uh, the things you say about me are actually really nice. And it seems like they're totally accurate as far as I can tell. Um, but I remember those things, too. But now that I've read them in a book, my memory seems like what you wrote. So you kind of changed my memory. And I thought to myself, what a jerk I am. <laughs> I mean, what an awful thing to do, change someone's memory. But I totally know what she means because, you know, if I went out, if we picked somebody in the audience here at random and said, you know, what's the most interesting thing that happened to you in eighth grade? You'd probably tell a story. But you wouldn't really be remembering what happened in eighth grade. You'd really be remembering the last time you told that story because this is kind of how narratives are built through our memory of, of sort of the, 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 the expository nature of talking about your life becomes what memory are, memories are. So I, I knew to a degree that that was probably true. So I'll never write a book like that again, even though I, I really, I, I mean, it makes me happy to just think about it. Um, <laughs> the next book after this was an anthology called Chuck Klosterman 4. Uh, it was just actually stuff I had done at, uh, you know, at newspapers, a couple from the forum, actually. Um, mostly, though, Esquire pieces, spin stories, things for the New York Times Magazine. And then I tacked on, um, frankly, a kind of bad piece of fiction at the end that I had written earlier in my life that I didn't want people to feel ripped off if they'd read all these things before. Uh, so I thought, I'll just give them something for free. You know, I'll just throw this in there. Um, but of course, people don't feel that way. They're like, why did you give me this bad story? Um, <laughs> The only thing that's kind of meaningful about this book to me, though, is it started to, to, to kind of create kind of a, a represent, I guess, sort of the philosophical change that was going in my mind about what was interesting to me about the world and therefore what was interesting to write about. The way that book is broken up, there's three sections. Things that are true, things that might be true, and something that's not true at all. Obviously, the last thing, the fiction piece, is what's not true at all. The things that might be true were like kind of columns and essays where I kind of presented ideas that I thought were interesting, and the things that were true was the actual journalism, where I did profiles or, or kind of investigated things. And I started to really get into this idea of the nature of reality. And I know that for a lot of people, like, this is a question that you stop thinking about when you're 17, like, what is real? You know, are we really here? I've never stopped thinking that way. <laughs> I mean, to me, it is really the central question of this period of time. Uh, it has a lot to do with the rise of the internet. It has to do with sort of uh, the explosion of reality television. It has to do with the fact that the most popular sort of genre of nonfiction now is the memoir, which is really an autobiography from an unfamous person, you know? <laughs> and it was this idea of, of sort of, is the, you know, the culture we're experiencing, um, is it even really happening, or is it kind of a construct that we make and move through? Um, one example that I, I, I use a lot is, you know, sometimes people will talk about the movie The Great Train Robbery, like this movie from 1903, 
And there are always these tales, and they might not even be true, but they seem like they could be true, that people watching film for the first time in 1903 would like see a train coming at them and they would duck. Or a guy would shoot a gun at the camera and they would, you know, hide because they had never experienced this idea of seeing something in motion that wasn't real. And, you know, we're all accustomed to this now, right? We watch television, we know it's, we know it's not real. We know that our lives are not the lives of the Sopranos. You know, we know that, like, our, our Facebook profile is not who we really are. <laughs> but these are sort of things that we understand intellectually, but we might not understand in a biological way. I mean, whatever, okay, I don't know when you think man first came about, you know, whether you go back 25,000 years to, like, East Africa, or if you go back 8,000 years to, like, the first hominid or whatever, 6,000 years, if you're a creationist, whatever the case may be, wherever you think that, that, that mankind began, up until just the very dawn of the 20th century, anytime somebody saw something in motion, it was actually moving. If you saw a tiger, a tiger was there, okay? <laughs> this was thousands of years, right? And if you go back even further, if you go back to whatever was sort of the genesis of what a human is, you know, all through time, we have been conditioned to see something and assume that it is reality. And now, in less than 150 years, that's no longer true. Now, many things that we see um, are, you know, uh, the, 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 this kind of fabricated image that we're just supposed to intellectually understand is not real. Um, there was a book that came out in the late 70s called Four Arguments for the Elimination of Television. And the author makes a very interesting point He's sort of like, if I asked you right now to close your eyes and imagine a basketball game, like you would all do that, right? You'd close your eyes and you would imagine a basketball game. In all likelihood, what you would imagine is what a basketball game looks like on television from that half-court shot about 15 rows up, even though probably everyone in this room at one point has played a game of basketball, certainly saw one live in high school or you know, played it at recess, and yet we're now conditioned to sort of have the TV image be the image that we accept. Or if I asked, you know, if someone said, like, imagine a plantation uh, during the Civil War, you could all do that, because you'd think about roots or gone with the wind or something. You've never been there, but you can do that, and that memory in your mind, that image in your mind, would be no different than the way you would think about your house when you were growing up. So I started thinking there's this real confusion over what is real and sort of what is a construct. And that became uh, what would eventually be uh, my, this book called Eating the Dinosaur. Okay? But prior to that, uh, Eating the Dinosaur was another essay collection again. You know, so it was sort of in line with some of these other things. But in between that fourth book and Eating the Dinosaur, I wrote a novel for the first time. And I think that... I should probably talk about it because it's actually a novel about a fictional North Dakota town. Um, you know, when you're a little kid, uh, you, you think of writing, when you think of writing as a kid, you really are imagining the idea of doing a novel, starting with nothing, starting with white paper, uh, now I guess just a white computer screen, and kind of creating everything. Creating all the people, creating the action. Uh, it, it, in some ways, I think it's, it's the most kind of artistic obstruction there is. You start with nothing, and you build a world around that. So I wanted to write a novel, uh, but I didn't know if I could. I had only done nonfiction work. And uh, I thought, you know, what if I write a book? I wasn't even worried about this novel being good. I just thought to myself, man, I hope it's not humiliating. I mean, that was really my main idea, that I wanted to write something that wouldn't be awful. So I thought, well, I better be, to a degree, be somewhat safe. I better write about something or create a world that I sort of understand. So I decided to write a book that was set in a small North Dakota town. Um, and I wanted to set it in the past, partially because I thought, I'm in a position to write a novel that people will read, and if I don't do this, I don't know if anybody will. I don't know if this idea of the period of the 1980s, the kind of the pre-internet, pre kind of before the proliferation of cable television, um, before cell phones, like that period of time, that last period, just before this rapid acceleration of technology, which was sort of, you know, the 80s and the early 90s, and, and this experience of being in this very rural place, you know, rural North Dakota will not be the way it is 
the way it is now, you know, in 25 years or whatever, it's going to change. I want to write about this. I thought like it's sort of, you know, I, I don't know, I, I want to say I was trying to give something back, but I thought like I want this, I want there to be a book about this experience I had. So I sort of create this town, um, uh, and I called the town Owl. I don't know why I chose Owl. Uh, I like the idea of their nickname at one time being the Owls. So they would be the Owl Owls. <laughs> there were certain things I wanted to write specifically. There was a, a cataclysmic blizzard that happened uh, in 1984, which I'm sure people in this room remember, some of you. Um, there was also uh, the Gordon Call shootings in Medina in 1983. Uh, and I want to use these real events as sort of bookends uh, for this time. Plus, 1984 is the most distant time that I can still sort of vividly remember. Like, I, I can very, like, if somebody says something happened in 1984, it doesn't seem that long ago to me. I mean, I know it is a long time ago, but it doesn't feel that way. Um, so I start building this idea that I was going to go back to 1984, and I was going to write about these three characters in this very small town. And, you know, because the cliché, particularly when you go out to other places, you know, and the cliché about small towns is that, of course, everyone knows everyone. Um, and that's not really true. Uh, the thing is, you recognize everyone. You know who they are. You know what they do. You sort of know all the rumors about their life. <laughs> but you don't really know who they are. You don't really know what their interior life is like. You don't really, you know, it's, it's almost as though you can exist with these people uh, for long stretches of time, seemingly in very close proximity, uh, and have no relationship whatsoever. So I made these three characters, a high school kid, uh, a high school teacher, and kind of an old guy. And I kind of wrote these three stories. Now, these stories, or the, the, the element, it's almost like there's three novellas in this book, and they're all together. And... What they were based on, partially, of course, was just totally creating, just making them up, but also a lot of the conversations I had had with my friends at college, because all my friends from college were like from Napoleon and Langdon and Munich and Lidgewood and, you know, all these different small towns, uh, you know, Cavalier, and what was amazing to me to learn, I think amazing to all of us, is that we all had the same stories. <laughs> like, it, 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 almost across the board, we'd all had these similar things. There had always been some teacher in town who had been rumored to be sleeping with the students. And there had always been sort of these conflicts within the sports program. And there had always sort of been this idea that any time a new woman moves to town, because it's so rare, that she's immediately pursued by every single guy simultaneously. <laughs> I thought these were all interesting, you know. So, so this is sort of what the nature of this book became. One thing I realized, though, okay, uh, if you write a nonfiction book and you put, pe you know, you write about people you know, their natural inclination is to mildly disagree with how they are projected. They'll be like, well, I'm not really like that, you know. That's sort of what I'm like, but I don't talk that way. When people have done stories about me and I read them later, it doesn't really seem like me, you know. It seems like a like kind of a skewed version of me. So if you write about real people, they will always think you got it wrong. However, if you write about fictional people, everyone you know will think they're in the book. This has absolutely happened, that it's like, you know, and, and, and it's a hard thing to, when, you, when someone talks to you about that, it's kind of hard to describe because you can never tell if they are outraged or very happy. So you're always trying to gauge how much you should pretend that it's based on them. Because the, here's the, re, you know, the real truth of these, of, of when you read a novel, I can't, I can't speak for all novelists, but speaking for myself, uh, when you read about a character, a fictional character, what you're mostly reading about is the writer. Every character in any of my books is mostly me. Just a sliver of my personality, maybe the worst part of my personality, maybe a person I would like to be, maybe the way I thought I would be if I was a woman, maybe like, you know, whatever, whatever the case may be. It's, it's, it's mostly this depiction of myself. Um, so when, you know, in this book, Downtown Owl, really, all of the characters are sort of different versions of myself, kind of mixed in with all these stories that I've heard from other people and just things that I thought would be funny. Um, but the reason I bring that up 
is because it kind of brings me to the, this last thing we're talking about, which is the current book, uh, which is called uh, The Visible Man. The Visible Man is the most distant uh, from myself, from all the other books I've written. I suppose technically it's sci-fi. It's a little science fiction-y because the premise is that there is a psychiatrist in Austin, Texas, a female psychiatrist, and she uh, gets a patient, call her, a, a patient calls her, wants to become her patient, but he refuses to meet her in public. He only wants to talk over the phone. He seems to have all these strange problems, and he won't describe what his real problem is. She wonders maybe he's a drug addict, or maybe he has agoraphobia, maybe he's obese, maybe he's deformed. And eventually he says, no, actually, um, I used to work uh, for the U.S. government, and I essentially designed a suit, or helped design a suit, that was going to be used for the, for the military as a cloaking device. It would be a suit that would refract light. I'm not going to go into all the detail of how I explain this, but the idea would be if, if I had this suit on, whatever, when, and you looked directly at me, you would always see what's 180 degrees behind me. It would move the light. So if you looked at this side of me, you would see that wall. You know, if you looked at me dead on, you would see, I guess, this small tree. Um, <laughs> And uh, the, 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 psych, the, the therapist, of course, thinks this person is insane. And he's got this real problem, a real psychosis, like a, a deep, you know, like this is a, maybe a profound uh, neurotic disorder that's maybe beyond her capabilities. But she sort of becomes uh, interested in him and in, in trying to help him because she thinks that almost uh, his damage is intriguing. But then comes to realize that he is not lying. That actually he, he does have the ability to become essentially invisible. And what he does with this power is go into people's houses when they're by themselves and simply watch how they live. He works from this premise that, you know, the goal of science, really the goal of anything, is to understand the experience of being alive. And he tries all these ways to do it. He tries to interview people as a journalist. He does research on people as sort of a sociologist. He studies people in focus groups, but he realizes that whenever people are around anyone else, they start editing themselves, and they project an image. This is at least his belief. So he decides the only way to really understand people is to see them when they don't realize they are being watched, and they are not reacting to anyone. They are not having a conversation with someone else. They are just being who they are, in you know, sitting in a room. Um, I'm going to read one page from this book. Uh, at one point, he's taught the, the character who's also, well, this is, this is the other, I, I should warn this element about the book. Um, I wanted this book to be as real as possible because I always want my fiction to seem like journalism uh, or at least like nonfiction. So I thought, well, what kind of person would both have the intellectual ability to make themselves virtually unseeable and also use it in this very unethical way? Well, it would be a terrible person. It would be a completely conceited, egocentric person who has no understanding of sort of the normal sort of social terms and social contracts of everyday life. He would be a really bad person. Okay, so that character is not very likable. Well, what would a therapist who deals with this person like be like? Well, a normal therapist, a good therapist, would distance themselves from this person. But this female character, her name is Victoria Vick, she becomes sort of mesmerized by him and wants to spend more and more time with him and starts kind of believing what she wants to believe. So she is a little bit dumb. So, <laughs> so we have an unlikable character and a dumb character. Not a lot of people to relate to. Uh, this may explain why the book did not sell as well as I had hoped. Um, but this character, this unlikable invisible man, uh, he's talking about uh, in one of their therapy se sessions because, you know, in a book like this, it's, it, there's a lot of exposition where they're in an office, he's sitting in a chair, just talking about these times. He sat in people's homes. Um, he starts talking about the, the failings of film and the idea that when you see a movie, you can never get, there, no film can be a real portrait of reality because if an intellectual person saw a real depiction of reality, they would be offended. They would see sort of people dealing with casual racism and casual sexism all the time. And, you know, they would, uh, they would be fulfilling stereotypes that we like to believe don't exist. And that movie reality is this false reality. 
What he says to her is, the reality I got to see was not movie reality. The reality I saw was just reality, without quotes. You want to know what I really learned? I learned that people don't consider time alone as part of their life. Being alone is just a stretch of isolation they want to escape from. I saw a lot of wine drinking, a lot of compulsive drug use. It was less festive than I anticipated. My view had always been that I was at my most alive when I was totally alone because there, that was the only time I could live without fear of how my actions were being scrutinized and interpreted. What I came to realize is that people need their actions to be scrutinized and interpreted in order to feel like what they're doing matters. Singular solitary moments are like television pilots that never get aired. They don't count. This, I think, explains the fundamental urge to get married and have kids, or even just the need to feel popular and respected. We're self-conditioned to require an audience, even if we're not doing anything valuable or interesting. I'm sure this started in the 1970s. I know it did. I think Americans started raising offspring with this implicit notion that they had to tell their children, you're amazing, you can do anything you want because you're a special person. They thought they'd be bad parents if they didn't do this. They felt the responsibility to give unlimited emotional support. But when you really think about it, that emotional support only applies to the experience of living in public. We don't have ways to quantify ideas like amazing or successful or lovable without the feedback of an audience. Nobody sits by himself in an empty room and thinks, I'm amazing. <laughs> it's impossible to imagine how that would work. But being amazing is supposed to be what life is about. As a result, the window of time people spend by themselves becomes these meaningless experiences that don't really count. It's filler. They're all deleted scenes. So in this, what this book mostly is, is the therapist talking with his patient and the patient describing what he sees or what he believes to see when he watches people by themselves. His idea being that when people talk about themselves, they of course are lying or fabricating something or constructing a lie that they want to believe. But what is sort of the, maybe the obvious conclusion here is what he sees other people doing he creates his own fantasy of what it means. The only thing we really learn about is him through talking. One thing I've learned as a journalist is that interviewing is an inherently flawed process. When I interview someone, I do not really understand what they are like or who they are. And yet, it's still the closest way we have to getting an understanding or a grasp on other people. There is no other option than asking someone, you know, uh, uh, how do you feel about this? Uh, I once interviewed uh, the filmmaker Errol Morris, and he said that he doesn't trust people who don't talk, because how do you know what they're thinking? You know? That's kind of true. Um, but, uh, so those are the books I've written, and, and, and uh, that's sort of the, I guess, the trajectory of my career. Uh, Again, I appreciate you coming here, but I'll tell you what, beyond that, that's all I have to say. Thank you so much for coming to talk, uh, for coming to listen to me tonight. I really appreciate it. It was an honor to be here, and uh, thank you very much for coming. Funding for this program is provided by the partners of Read North Dakota, our authors, our stories, and by the members of Prairie Public. <laughs>